Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar on this Wednesday afternoon. Uh, I'm just waiting for some people to join still. We had around 140 registrations. So we're just giving the guys some time to connect and log in. If you allow me maybe another minute. Okay, I think we've got critical mass. Guys, thank you very much for taking time this afternoon, joining us with this webinar around embedded contextual analytics, and I think very specifically around mobile. Um, what I'd like to do sometime during the presentation, if you can maybe use the, the chat box below, uh, just uh, drop a comment there. What was the reason why you joined this webinar? It's always good to know what the, the topic of interest is. Uh, I believe from my side that uh, the mobile is fairly unique. Um, if you've uh, attended some of the other webinars that we've done, uh, most everything we do is around embedded or contextual analytics. And uh, today is no different, but uh, we've added the mobile component. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce you also to Demetrius Ganesh. He's the BI executive for MIP, one of our partners. And uh, the emphasis today is actually on him. I'm just going to spend some time to talk around embedding and some of the challenges we face. And then later on, I'm gonna hand over to him to talk you through, I think I'll call it a success story. They've uh, they've identified a real good niche, a use case, but let me not steal his thunder. For today, I'm just gonna go through, maybe just to introduce myself, um, Gustav Piata, I've been in IT for many years. I think the gray hair can, can show that. Uh, I've been involved with business intelligence and reporting for most of those years, around about 12 of those, around business intelligence specifically, uh, and uh, used to sell some of the other products. I, I got involved with Yellowfin at AIGS in uh, 2014. And since then, I just, I, I just love the product. I love the community and I love the angle. Um, analytics has always been a passion of mine. I love systems, I love data. So uh, I hope that I'm qualified to take you through this. Um, without further ado, also maybe just mention uh, Idera. At this point, Idera is the holding company. They acquired Yellowfin in November 2021, uh, and Yellowfin has now been fully integrated into the, the, the bigger uh, range of companies that they own. Just a couple of them listed there. Uh, some exciting news around fusion charts in Yellowfin coming up soon. Not sure how public that is yet, but uh, there's some exciting enhancements coming for the latest release of Yellowfin. And again, just to mention, we are ranked number one for embedded operational BI or embedded analytics uh, across many of the, the, the companies that, that do these evaluations. Uh, we also rank very high in various other categories, which is around the easy adoption, but uh, I'm not going to take you through that today. The focus for today is to talk about contextual and embedded analytics. So we'll talk a little bit about the maturity curve. I'll then talk a little bit about the industrial revolution and uh, what that brings today for us. Then we'll talk a bit about the challenges that we face uh, that, that's brought on by, by the adoption. And lastly, there's going to be a little bit of a sales pitch. We have to talk about the value of the product. So the last few slides will be about Yellowfin and some functionality, at which end we'll hand over to Demi then and to take you further. So just to reiterate again, what is embedded analytics? It's basically when you have, and the note this is BI report, but I want to make it general. It's not just business intelligence reports. It's when you embed reports, dashboards, and analytics as part of your application, either using frames, hyperlinks, buttons, uh, just making BI or reporting part of your application stack. The super seed of that is contextual analytics, and it's very much the same. It's when those same reports, dashboards, are basically part of the workflow of the, of the application. And uh, in most of our, our ISV engagements, where we uh, have new partners that make use of Yellowfin, we, we get them to move into that area as soon as possible because that's where the value lies. You're not um, having a separate business intelligence tool. The customer consumes the product as if it's part of the core application. And that has a huge amount of, of value add when you've reached that point. Before you can get there, it's always good to understand where you are with your company. 
in terms of the, the capability or maturity curve, uh, most companies these days are, have gone beyond level one, two, and three. They operate typically uh, a level four where you've had standalone business analytics, access to reporting um, that is made available to the users. For level five or contextual analytics, that's where you've now embedded the application as part of your solution. And uh, the focus for today is gonna to be around those customers specifically. So what can you do next? It's always important to understand where you are in the maturity curve. Consider if you have contextual analytics, what is the value that can be added to your solution and uh, evaluate how this can align you with maybe a modernization environment or a modernization project where you have the product being modernized by enabling analytics. As I said before, when you've reached level five, that is where you want to be. But even within level five, or what we call a very high analytic capability, uh, there's different ways or, or different uh, areas where you could have focused on. Maybe you've done the single sign-on, meaning people don't have to log in again. Maybe it's contextually embedded. Maybe it's just hyperlink embedded. Or maybe it's even part of the workflow. Uh, Demi is going to talk to us around what they've done and the very good use case of making Yellowfin or embedded reports part of the workflow of an, of an application. So just before we get there, where are we today? We are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution and uh, around about 2015, the people, the guys that do all these research, they basically said, we, we can, we're gonna focus on machine learning, cloud computing, big data analytics, as well as virtual reality and artificial intelligence. Now, from my side, I've highlighted where I've seen a lot of growth. I've seen a lot of machine learning I've seen cloud mature to an uh, extent where a lot of our customers are in cloud now. And big data, the term has become unison to, to having access to a lot of information. I've not seen a lot of adoption around virtual reality outside of the gaming arena. We are seeing some big promises from the, looks, uh, the likes of Apple and Google. But where we have seen significant enhancements and adoption around artificial intelligence in, in recent years, well, recent months actually, so sort of mid last year to now, there's been a lot of movement around AI. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time around that. But just looking forward, uh, the researchers believe we are in the sort of 2020s. We're gonna move into what's called the fifth industrial revolution or human inclusive support. Uh, basically having applications, systems, people working together. And then a statement there that says, uh, shifting from profit to purpose not sure whether that's going to happen. I think as long as there are, are listed companies out there, profit's always going to be a driver, but there should be a lot of value add. So just a slide on the adoption. Um, this slide was actually presented by ChatGTP, um, the company OpenAI that launched ChatGTP uh, version 3.5 was launched in November 2022, so a couple of months ago. And the blue line actually shows you how good that system was in completing the various exams. So these are all exams below. I think one I wanted to focus on, the uniform bar exam, the first uh, big green bar there. So ChatGTP 3.5 had a capability to write that exam and basically got around 10%. With the release of ChatGTP 4, which was in May uh, 2023, it's only about five months after initial release, you can see the growth curve that was there where now ChatGTP4 can write that bar exam, will pass that exam with a 90% pass rate, which puts it in the top five percentile of best performers in that exam. And a lot of these other uh, exams, uh, very significantly, you can see that the AI has substantially increased its capability. Now, how does that relate to what we do today? Um, as these AIs are becoming available, we are using that even to generate more data. Now, ChatGTP is not the only large language model or LLM out there. This is just a list of the, the, the top, I think, 15 um, large language models. And what you can see there, the adoption or the activity from these guys, BERT being the AI that was released by Google, there's ChatGTP in second place, and there's many others there. Uh, even some of these today, you can download them uh, with a predefined data set and you can run them locally on a computer if you need to. So also the days of having huge engines uh, needed to run this in the background, that's also changing significantly. So we see the adoption of large language models throughout a lot of industries. 
Now, just a scary stat or a scary uh, picture there. If you look at where artificial intelligence is being invested in, these are the uh, areas, this was done in 2020, so this slide's actually outdated, but if you look at each of these industries, you can see there's a lot of companies investing in some sort of artificial intelligence within their vertical market. So there's a lot that we can expect coming from these companies. Some of this has gone into production. You'd recognize some of the names. Uh, a lot of these are in POC phase and, uh, and being addressed. And there's a lot of press around that. So what we do know, the fourth industrial revolution, fourth industrial revolution does bring a lot of data. The challenge with that is, or, or maybe before that, that data then is used by businesses like never before. We're seeing the consumption of data also being advanced significantly. It's not just about <clears throat> transactional data or metadata. All of the data are now being used to enhance the, the usability for customers. The challenge with that is we are generating a humongous amount of data. Uh, this was Eric Schmidt a couple of years ago. Uh, up until 2003, we had generated around five exabytes of data. Uh, at this point, they believe we are generating that every two days. So again, just to look at what the industry researchers are saying, they believe that by 2025, we'll be in the realm of uh, what's called zettabytes. So that means uh, you'll have around 200 zettabytes of data being generated annually by the industry. Um, so exabyte is a one with uh, 18 zeros, zettabyte being one with 21 zeros. So these are huge amounts of data that's being made available um, to end users. Now, if we look at why this is happening, this slide actually takes you through the adoption rate for various uh, businesses. If we look at Netflix, it took them a couple of years to get to a million subscribers. Uh, Airbnb, a little bit quicker. Facebook, 10 months. Dropbox, Spotify, Instagram. Took them 2.5 months to get from being launched into 2.5 million, uh, two and a half months to get to 1 million users. Now, ChatGTP, it took them five days to get to 1 million users. So we can see that the adoption rate, um, because of various uh, facts like technology, is, is, is becoming significantly higher than before. And uh, yeah, it's all around why are we doing this? It's, it's a lot of data that's been generated. So for those who are into social media, you would have realized that or read that uh, Meta, the owners of Facebook, they released a product called Threads. This was literally last week, Tuesday or Thursday, actually. Um, and uh, it's a direct competitor for, for Twitter. So maybe Elon is worried about it, maybe not. Uh, you can see a lot of, of comments in the, in the social media platforms being done. The scary thing about that is they went from launch to 10 million users in seven hours. So the adoption rate there, even faster than you can think. Yes, they cheated a little bit. If you had an Instagram account, you were prompted to go to threads. And if you had a thread account and you opened your thread account, all of your followers from Instagram would have been notified. So they had very clever marketing to take customers and, and get to 10 million users. But need, needless to say, um, it's a big challenge for the other guys that are trying to dominate the social media markets. So the problem with the, the adoption and the lot of data, or the problem with the data is the adoption. There's many types of data. The data comes from various sources. Often the data is ambiguous and disorganized. We don't really know who needs the data or who's going to use the data. And then the big old data literacy. So I think although there is a huge focus and emphasis, even I see at school levels, to get um, learners to be data aware and uh, intuitive around data, there's a huge shortage in knowledge around data and specifically around the skills of data discovery and analytics, and even more so around data experts. Uh, just as a note, the highest paid job last year was data science, uh, and, and that shows to the, the shortage of the skills in that specific arena. The challenge also is that traditional tools, old legacy tools, are not flexible. They don't really allow you to move into consuming these data, the data sets. So where does this data come from? The term big data has been coined, and big data just includes everything from structured, unstructured, semi-structured, open source data, um, logging data, as well as geospatial data. So all of these types of data is being made available. The challenge is how does a business user consume this? So if we look at the factors that uh, impact this, 
It's important to understand what's the volume of data that you're gonna be exposed to, what's the velocity, in other words, the speed at which this data is gonna come in, the variety, where are you gonna source this data from or where does it originate from? Viability is, can I consume this data? Is it usable? The value of the data, there's a lot of talk about data being um, the next gold or the next oil. Uh, the veracity, in other words, is this uh, a certain, are you certain about the data and how you can consume and use this? How valid is that data? Is it outdated? And then volatile, how soon will it become uh, obsolete to you? So these are all, it's referenced as the eight Vs around big data. And you need to think about these when you're moving into, into that scenario. So with Yellowfin, uh, we've always known the challenge is gonna be to serve two sets of customers. We have the data analysts, the data scientists, the clever people, they are technical and they've known how to use these tools and they've been using tools to get to what they want to do. The challenge is how do we get business people to do the same in an environment where they don't have to be too technical uh, and where you are faced with all these challenges. Yellowfin's always been focused around the business users you see everything we do is, is built around being simple and easy for the user, even to the point where when we embed our software with our customers' applications, even that embedding is made as simple as possible to make sure that the adoption there is good. Incidentally, Yellowfin ranks very high with adoption rates, where worldwide uh, BI products have around a 15 to 17% adoption rate. Yellowfin is way above the 50% mark, and I would attribute that to the fact that most of our stuff uh, within our customer portals are embedded into the applications. So by default, when the application is being consumed, those users aren't confronted with a different tool, different logging, different challenges. It's part of the application and what they do. The challenge also with this data is you don't really know what the customer sees. Yes, we're presenting charts, but even charts can be ambiguous. So it's also important to make sure that the message within the data is being portrayed properly. And you'll see there's a lot of emphasis in Yellowfin and the product stack to make sure that you allow your customer to understand it, what it is that you are presenting. The presentation platforms for Yellowfin has always been the actual dashboards in the browser, nothing funny and nothing strange about that. The data storytelling is a huge element where it's important for us to narrate what you're doing. And then for the focus for today, we also look at the mobile. Uh, today, we are seeing uh, three times more mobile devices than any other electronic devices out there. So although we still have people consuming applications on a, a, on a desktop or a mobile, a desktop or a, a laptop, there are a lot of users that only consume data via mobile feed. So if you've developed your, your BI strategy all around the actual dashboards and storytelling, you are missing a big gap with possible customers. Um, I think this is where we're going to bring in Demetrius. They've realized that is a big shortcoming. I'm not going to steal his thunder, but he's going to take you through why they identified that and, and how that was done. So just again, by doing the embedding, you are actually addressing a, a huge constraint that there is, that, the, that there is available, a huge constraint in the market. And I, I like using the, the Africa landscape where in the remote areas, they, they never had landlines and communication has always been a challenge. They've literally skipped landlines. Most of Africa these days are covered by either 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, and now using things like uh, uh, satellite connectivity. So they, they skipped the landlines. They went directly to communicate from nothing into modern technology. And uh, if you do embedding, you can create the same scenario within your application. So instead of having your data sources go through your, your uh, BI or ETL processes, then expose that via dashboards and then only do analytics. You can skip those processes. You can directly from data source and your application uh, from data source directly into your application. So it really makes your adoption much easier. So yeah, we know people think differently about data. And the question is, does it really matter? Within Yellowfin, uh, it does matter for us what we do and how we differentiate ourselves. Being focused around the end users, uh, there's a huge uh, deployment drive now around something we call natural language query, with the big difference being guided natural language. There are a lot of other tools that allow natural language. Uh, that comes with the constraint uh, within Yellowfin. 
they take you down the guided path. So the moment that you expose your data, you expose your view in our scenario, you can tailor what the customer can see and you can make it easy for him to go through a path of accessing his data with the Yellowfin engine, automatically generating the visualization, the report, everything that needs to go to the back end, and everything generated by the NLQ can then be consumed in a normal data warehouse or a BI environment. We also focus a lot around the narration. So we have a, a, a business offering called Yellowfin Stories, which is something that a typical business user, having read, read a lot of blogs, will feel very comfortable. It provides an ecosystem where decision-making is being driven by the narration, the process, the information, the actual reports. And then lastly, contextual embedding that literally takes the, the BI stack to your end user immediately. So what does that bring you? Uh, the value drivers, having embedded analytics, it allows you to look at software licensing differently. You are not now selling additional licenses for uh, access via named users, for instance. The implementation cost can be significantly lower as this is being deployed by your application. You would already have your frameworks in place to deploy the application, whether that's browser-based or not. It becomes very easy to do that. You can minimize your internal cost. You can reuse some of the capabilities from your design teams, your support teams to also support that environment. Uh, we do in Africa still find a lot of companies having on-prem deployments uh, within the Yellowfin ecosystem. We do cater for going SaaS or, or cloud platforms, as well as on-premise. And then the last, value-based pricing. A big difference for us as a solution provider, uh, we can make sure you can offer you this, this type of functionality to your end users on a value-based pricing. It doesn't have to fall back into named users or, or limitations around that. So in close, uh, it is generally much cheaper and much faster to deploy VI products in a contextual embedded environment, which allows you to get to your customers very quickly. The important part is, do you know what they want? Do you know what they need? And are you in the right level of the maturity curve to allow yourself to make the right decision? I've opened the questions now slide. Uh, if you want, you can post questions into the chat. I think what we'll do is we'll leave the questions until uh, after the next session. At this point, uh, I'd like to introduce Demetrius. As I've said, he's uh, head of big data for MIP. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's got some exciting things to share. A success story from their side. Demi, over to you. Thanks a lot, Gustav. Um, some interesting insights there from your presentation. I think I might need to relook at our name, big data, because I think we've got some components, but I mean, we don't have all of those supplemental um, third-party data supplementing our, our offering there. So it was quite interesting seeing that stuff. Um, also the evolution of the chat GPT and how it's evolved and how quickly it's getting better was hell of interesting. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm not gonna take up too much time. My presentation is normally about 10 to 15 minutes. And basically um, I've got to show you um, you know, some um, actual implementation of what Gustav's been talking about. But in order to get there, I just got to give you some background about our product and uh, the infrastructure that allowed us to get to the to the final point, which is um, providing mobile access to data. Um, <clears throat> right, so a little bit about, about MIP. Um, e, we have five Five applications uh, out in the market for for different industries: healthcare, risk and funding, individual life and risk, group life, um, fund benefits and annuities, and a lending system. Um, so those are five individual applications, and underpinning those applications, we've got sort of different uh, teams within MIP that support those. Um, that ranges from our tech ops department to research and innovation, and then the, the Big important ones are continuous improvement teams uh, and our big data teams. <clears throat> now, why that's relevant is continuous improvement. Um, that little team has, a, um, I think they've got about, uh, I think I could be mistaken, I think it's between 10 and 12 app developers that just develop mobile apps for our clients. And then we've got um, the big data team and what we do is we sort of write um, <clears throat> reports and analytics for our clients. And, and the idea there is to separate application development from analytics on our applications. 
Um, right. So, so the architecture that we needed to build to support the offering um, for our applications. It, traditionally, we used to use our developers, our application developers, to write reports. But <clears throat> as we've evolved, we've realized it was a bad idea. So now, what we do on our applications for each one of those five applications, um, we implement a real-time or a near real-time data application from the MIP system through to what we term our ODS or operational data store. And uh, we don't do any transformation there. You know, with the, the main objective here is to get the data off the production system as quickly as possible for any reporting and in analytics. And the reason that we do this is um, Number one is, is, you know, you've got a separate team that specializes in, in analytics and getting data out, um, and that's separate skills to application development. Um, and also to protect your data at source. Uh, any, any access to data should almost happen to a downstream system um, rather than to the data at source. Um, that's number one. And, and secondly, any queries that happen for analytics shouldn't impact your operational processing, any of your capturing your new business, or any kind of processing of that nature. Um, so a little bit more about that infrastructure. The aim of that infrastructure was basically to get to a point where you have um, you know, your, your operational system being sourced from one server or one set of hardware, um, and your reporting and your analytics to be sourced from a separate system, but use it to have a separate or disconnected field. You want the user to log in once, to see, to, to be able to work, do his daily job, uh, but also have some valuable insight into the data, some valuable um, about the data that they're working on, and not realize that those visualizations are actually coming from a different place. Um, and so that that's the end game that we were aiming for, and that and that I think we've we've achieved. Um, what we are doing is, is on our operational data store, on our ODS, we are doing more operational processing. And by that, I mean, um, you know, we, we do analytics on data that's not older than a year. Because the data is not transformed, it is basically a schema replica of production. Um, it means we can get access to the data quickly, but it's not geared properly for for, for analytics. So we use that for operational uh, reporting, and then we've got a separate feed to a warehouse, which we use for more analytical type reporting. So why is this important? Um, and, and what's the problem with that? The nice thing about that is, is you know, our system is an ERP system um, that helps, you know, people in the insurance industry manage their businesses. Um, and that caters for your users that are actually sitting in front of, of PCs, capturing um, new business, doing claims, and those kind of things. And it, ca it also caters for a middle management layer of those clients where you need to understand how are my, uh, how's my teams performing, how's my sales floor performing, and that kind of thing, and I can manage workload. workload. But it does not cater for owners of businesses and for CEOs and those kinds of guys who, who we know have the good life. Um, but they, they typically don't log into these systems. They don't, you know, for them, the business is on the golf course or at an event or at the dinner with a partner or the vendor. Um, and so we need to be able to give them the tools so that they can run their business wherever they are. And so that was the problem we had. We had one customer in particular who, who struggled with this, who kept on phoning, I, I need information about my business. I need to know what's happening on the sales floor. Um, and so our solution for that was um, basically to provide insights into the, into the customer's business through a mobile app because everybody's got a mobile app nowadays. And, and I mean, it's, it's information at your fingertips. Um, because our ODS is a near real-time sync of the data, it meant that, you know, our Yellowfin um, reports are near real-time, which meant if we if we exposed Yellowfin graphs, visualizations, dashboards on a mobile app, um, all you've got to do is log into your mobile app 
and you've got all the information there that you need. Um, so that was the, the solution. How we went about uh, implementing that is, uh, is uh, again, we needed a lot more of the infrastructure in place to be able to get there. Um, luckily for us, uh, we have a team for mobile app development, um, and so they are able to produce a shell. Um, but the nice thing is that the method of embedding on the mobile app is exactly the same method that we use to embed Yellowfin into our web application. Um, we make a service call to Yellowfin to get a session ID. Um, we get a U we build up a URL with a unique ID of a specific dashboard and report, and that URL is almost embedded into. You can almost think of it of, uh, as an iframe or an object tag within the mobile app. Um, our source mobile app was a hybrid app, which meant that um, you, you can have the hybrid app sitting in, in a sort of HTML type form, and you can compile it for Apple, you can compile it for Android, you can compile it for Huawei. Um, so so that, that actually aided us as well, uh, big time. Um, so this is, this is a, a sort of um, a screenshot of our mobile app. Um, this is not the entire mobile app. Um, there's a banner on the top of, of the mobile app with the logo of the customer, which we've removed. And it, on the footer, there's another little sort of banner type um, with, with, with a few buttons that we allow the user to navigate through um, other options or other pages on the mobile app. Um, but what this is, is on the top you'll see, this is actually a, a Yellowfin dashboard it was actually designed for our web screens that we ported in, and we just used it on the mobile app. Um, so the first step that we're looking at, you can see is a MTD or a month to date. And that first line graph is showing you sales per product um, for this particular customer for the last seven days. Um, and then the bar graphs at the bottom basically show us um, the green bar showing us sales made. Um, the um, the little quick bar there shows you um, sort of the expected sales based on your history for the month and, and the amount of days left. It's a forecast of the sales that you will make. And then the, the right bar just gives you a target that you should be achieving. Uh, those targets are set by our customers. So this is the first tab. Um, and this was um, what our customer wanted to see about his sales floor. Um, there is a second tab, a, a today tab. And if I go to the next slide, you will see the today the today um, tab of the dashboard, and it's got a couple of bubbles on it. So the first uh, column of bubbles on the left give you an idea of the sales made today per product. So each line would be a, a different product. Um, the little blue bubble next to it, uh, or in the middle, is your sales target you should be uh, you know looking to achieve for the day. And then uh, on the right, the bar graphs for each of those products give you an idea of the calls made for those products, the number of leads we've got, and the number of um, um, cases in, in progress. So that's work in progress. Um, so this was a, another part of the mobile app. Um, now, the, again, the nice thing is because it's a hybrid app, it can be skinned differently. You can set your different um, background colors and your styling again based on CSS. All right. Um, then this is a screen of a drill down from um, from that that um, dashboard we looked at earlier. You can see on the top of the of the screenshot there it says that you know we were at today's sales and targets and we've drilled down now to look at the sales per agent. Um, so we've got a campaign uh, and you can see the the number of sales made per agent. So it's almost like a little leaderboard. So um, the owner of this particular business could see the sales floor, how they're performing, are they meeting their targets, and which sales agents are actually performing. Um, so that, that was extremely handy for them. Right. Um, so this this little screenshot also aimed to show you that, you know, um, Yellowfin embedded into a mobile app is extremely, um, Functional. So even the pop-ups work there. So you can see in the middle of the screen, it's 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 um it's not as clear, but you can see the pop-up that allows you to drill through to a child um, report there. Um, I've had to obfuscate some of the data there. Um, 
but the capability is there, it's fully functional. Right. Um, what were some of the challenges to be aware of in providing, um, in providing this for us? Um, sizing is a big issue. So, you know, technically speaking, you could take a dashboard or a report that was written for the web application and you could embed it into the mobile app and Yellowfin does a marvelous job of resizing it up or resizing it down. Uh, but Yellowfin can only do so much. If you take one of those um, bar graphs that I, I showed you earlier with just three bars and you show it on a 23 inch monitor, you're just gonna have three big uh, uh, bars that with a lot of sort of white space or blank space. Uh, so while you technically you can take a dashboard or a report that is built for the web and just use it on a mobile app, app it, it technically will work, but it's not practical. What we see is that if you want to write uh, or provide visualizations and dashboards um, for a mobile device, you've got to design those for the, the screen sizes. And even, even if you're gonna design it for, for a mobile app, you've got to look at the range of sizes because mobile apps now, I mean, they range from extremely tiny to extremely um, large, almost tablet size. Um, and so you've got, to, you've got to make it practical that, that it looks good on the screen, especially with the amount of data. If you've got a line, uh, a line graph and you've got, you know, 100 data points, it looks nice on a big screen, but you cramp that into a mobile device and it doesn't look as nice. Um, so we've had to play around with, with um, our content. We started using our web content and just ported it to, to mobile, but we quickly realized that we needed to redesign some of those, those visualizations. Another challenge to be aware of is um, you need to cater for multiple devices. The minute we showed this to our client, everybody wanted to get their hands on it. And so some of the directors had Apple devices, well, most of them had Apple devices, but some of them had Android devices, some of them had Huawei devices. And so we needed to cater for those multiple uh, technologies. And there are slight differences in the capability across those technologies. So your testing sort of needs to be um, quite, quite intense there. Um, UI limitations, something to be aware of. Um, you know, on your mobile device, you don't have a hover. You can't hover over, you know, like you can on, on a web screen. And so you need to be aware of that. Also, on a, on a web screen, you've got touch capability. So you can touch uh, and, and scroll and touch and drill down. And on some of the devices, we notice that the device gets confused between a touch and a scroll. If you want to scroll, it thinks you want to drill down. So those kind of things, you have to sort of play around with it and say, okay, maybe it's better if I disable my tooltips, disable all pop-ups, and just allow drill down, or this dashboard, we're not gonna allow drill down, we're just gonna allow you to scroll. So those kind of things you need to be aware of. Um, security is a big a big thing to also be aware of. Luckily, our infrastructure allows for that, um, because if you are, uh, you know, if you are using embedded analytics on your mobile device, you know, people can deconstruct it and look at the APIs to get access to the data. So you've got to make sure that these mobile devices are, are secure. Um, and that's it from my side in terms of in terms of what we've done practically to implement, um, you know, Yellowfin right throughout our stack in our product offering. And it is adding tremendous value to our application. Our application is very techy um, and Yellowfin helps us to sort of visualize our data in a more um, understandable, readable, intuitive manner. Demi, right. thank you very much. Uh, Any we're questions? right at the 40 minute mark. Yeah, we're right at the 40 minute mark. There has been some questions. So uh, guys, you're welcome to stay on if you need to go. Thanks for joining us for this past 40 minutes. Hope it is valuable. Um, Demi, just to maybe take you through some of the questions. Uh, your marketing material talks around having 20 million people touched every month. So that's a lot of data. How do you decide what comes from the ODS and what goes into a warehouse? Um, okay, so we're very specific. Um, 
our ODS is used for operational processing, so we don't uh, operational reporting. Apologies. Um, so we don't send all the data across. We identify the tables that need that are going to add value. So we, we try not to clog the pipeline with unnecessary data. We switch on data feeds only for the tables that are necessary. Um, but because it's nested, we, we feed from our operational system to our ODS and from our ODS to our warehouse. It means that if something is needed in the warehouse, um, it's going to have to be in the ODS as well. But the difference between the two is, is again, our ODS has got um, basically a schema replica of our production system, where our warehouse, we start flattening data structures, we start aggregating data, uh, we start supplementing the data with external um, data sources and those kind of things. I don't know if I've answered the question appropriately. Yeah, I think it does. Um... Next question, um, I think it was partially answered during the presentation. It came in, uh, who is your audience for the mobile? Uh, I think the answer there was you identified management teams as being people that don't have access and you really wanted to focus on that. And the second part of the question, are you looking at expanding that further into other areas, uh, operational question mark? Yeah, it's a, there's a there's a very new use case that we've got. So we've got embedded reports, we've got embedded dashboards, we've got contextual visualizations. And by contextual visualizations, what we mean is we've got a screen that's operational, but somewhere in the middle of the screen, we make a call to Ulefin to show a visualization about a part of the data. And we've got mobile. And the next step that we are doing is uh, one of our customers has requested that we make um, the reports and the dashboards part of the workflow. What that means is um, you you do step number one, step number two of your workflow. Step number three is to is to visualize a, a report on screen or a dashboard on screen. Have the user acknowledge, uh, check the data, and then move on to the next step in the workflow. So it is actually becoming a big part of our application. Okay, and then I can see there's some technical questions. Um, uh, Yellowfin has a mobile app. Did you use that? Uh, you mentioned doing your own mobile development. Uh, what was the decision and uh, your choices around that? Yeah. So when we we played around with the with the Yellowfin uh, mobile app quite a, quite a while back, and, and when when we had played with it, we found it was a bit it wasn't as mature as as we we were expecting. But the main driver of why we're using our own mobile app and we're embedding um, Yellowfin into it is the fact that we're using sort of other features on our mobile app. Our mobile app has got um, other client servicing capabilities. And so Yellowfin is just part of that, you know? So we've got, we've got a, a, a broker mobile app and then now what we've got is a management mobile app where, where um, a top level manager can perform certain actions on his business, authorize payments and those kind of things. And part of that is to see maybe his payment history on, uh, you know, of his authorized payments. That comes from you. Okay. Now maybe just talk about the Yellowfin app. Um, the Yellowfin mobile app, both on Android and iOS is available. Um, it does have a certain way of usage. Uh, the design thinking with from Glenn and the guys that did it, uh, they, they, they never thought the adoption on mobile and BI would be that big. So there was a lot of emphasis around Yellowfin stories and then only consuming a report in a Yellowfin story, for instance. Uh, and in your case, you've actually identified it to be different and you've actually got actual reports running in the mobile app. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, one short question, what technology was used for the mobile dev? Oh, you're asking me something now, and I don't think I have the answer. We've jumped a few technologies uh, in the past few years. I think we've jumped across three technologies. Um, I'm sorry, I'll have to get that answer. I could I could send it out afterwards, um, but I okay. don't have it. Apologies. No Apologies. Yeah, we know who posed the question. We can respond to them directly. And I think the last two, more or less the same question, uh, the one said, um, were you able to utilize some of your previously developed um, assets? And then another question is, were these developments um, responsive? In other words, interactive on the mobile? Yeah. So um, to, 
to answer the first question, yes, that's how we started. We took our existing visualizations that, you, you know, when, when, when the CEO of the business came to us and said, listen, I don't know what's happening. We said to him, here's your dashboard. It's on the system. Go and look at it. Um, and he said, I, I don't even have a login to the system. Um, at which point we step back and we re-looked at the way we delivering to different target, target audiences. Um, and we started off by using the existing capability that we had on the web and just using it on the mobile. And that's where we found mm, we needed to tweak it a little bit for it to be valuable. Um, that's number one. Number two, in terms of responsiveness, Yes, the the mobile app because we've got full web capability there. We've got full roll down. We are, you know um, the graph size really well on a mobile device on an Apple on an Android as well as on a tablet, um, which is really really nice. I mean, Elephant does a good job of resizing, which is one thing we're grateful for. There. Excellent, Demi. That uh, concludes the questions. Um, if you guys have any, any more questions in the, the tabs on your presentation, you'll see there's a link to my email and Demi's email. You're welcome to drop us uh, messages. We'll respond to that. And uh, this was 45 minutes. So I really appreciate your time. Thanks for the input, Demi. I know it's a big investment of time from you. I do appreciate it. Thanks for your time. And uh, everybody else, I hope we can have an engagement soon. I'd like to chat to you all. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.